and welcome to this last lecture of this lecture series on high performance computer architecture. In this lecture, I shall, uh, I shall consider the topic cluster, grid and cloud computing. So, these are the three topics uh, which are little interrelated, but definitely they are not same. Uh, and I shall consider them one after the other and uh, as we uh, cover different topics, we shall highlight their differences also. First, let us look at the motivation behind cluster computing. You will find that there are many applications that require high performance computing. So, uh, numerous applications are nowadays available uh, are uh, present which requires high performance computing and that can be satisfied with the help of cluster computing and some examples of this high performance computing requirement, I mean which requires high performance computing is, are, is given here. Number one is numerous scientific and engineering applications like modeling, simulation and analysis of complex systems like climate, galaxies, molecular structure, nuclear explosion uh, and uh, uh, weather forecasting and so on. And also there are applications which requires high performance computing in business and internet applications such as e-commerce and web servers, five servers, databases and so on. And for these applications, if you want to have a very dedicated computer, custom made computer with custom software, it is pretty costly and moreover uh, this custom hardware and software does not allow, uh, I mean not only they are very expensive, uh, they cannot be, uh, they are not extensible. That means, they cannot be extended as the requirement goes up. So, I mean some kind of supercomputers are needed to uh, satisfy this high performance computing requirement but unfortunately they are not extensible, extendable. And uh, the cost effective approach is to use uh, cluster, grid and cloud comping, computing for, uh, for these high performance compu uh, computing to satisfy this computing requirement. And as we shall see how uh, these are performed in these three situations. And uh, as I have already mentioned examples applications of cluster computing and uh, which has, uh, I mean you may be asking in which situation you will use cluster computing. These are the several situations like where you require large run times, real time constraints are to be satisfied, large memory usage is there, uh, then you, you require high I O usage. Then uh, you require fault tolerance and uh, also you want to have high availability. In such situations, you will go for cluster computing. So, uh, as I mentioned, high performance computing is the main motivator and it is an alternative to symmetric multiprocessing to provide high performance and availability. And as a consequence, clustering uh, has become a very hottest uh, topic. Uh, in computer system design. You may be asking how do you define a cluster, com how do you define cluster computing? Actually, it can be defined as coordinated use of interconnected autonomous computers in a machine room. That means, you are interested to perform the computing with the help of a interconnected, uh, uh, in interconnected array of computers inside a room, single room. It is not that uh, they are dispersed throughout the, uh, th th throughout the country or throughout the large geographical area, but uh, in, a sing in a machine room. And you, uh, you notice another term autonomous. Autonomous by autonomous we mean each and every computer is, uh, is a complete system, can work independently without the need of others. That is why we call it cluster computing. So, you can say a collection of standalone workstations or PCs that are interconnected by high speed uh, network, maybe a local area network. 
and work as an integrated collection of resources. So, you find the in addition to uh, this uh, you know you, I mean the, the important feature is you have a large number of systems, but at the same time uh, they work in an integrated manner and they provide a single system image, they have a single system image spanning all its nodes. So, this is a very important concept, you will require a special software layer to provide this as we shall see. Uh, actually the cluster computing has become popular because of two reasons. Number one is uh, nowadays you, you can have personal computers which are pretty powerful at a very affordable price. Similarly, you can have computer networks like switches, uh, different types of switches uh, which also are available at a very uh, low price. So, uh, these two is the main motivation uh, and uh, so uh, th that means, uh, it, is, it is now possible to connect cluster of workstations with latencies and bandwidths comparable to the two tightly coupled machines because of the advancement of uh, your uh, networking technology. So, uh, we can build uh, a system by using commodity of the self components. What are the commodity of the self components? We shall be using standard PCs or workstations and we shall be using standard networking components. So, clusters uh, started to take off in 90s, clusters of IBM, Sun, DEC workstations are connected by 100 megabyte uh, Ethernet, 100 megabit Ethernet LAN, HP clusters and so on. So, you, you can see we are using standard local area network to link the link uh, different nodes. And as I have already mentioned, uh, although you have got several interconnected computers, but it gives a single system is a image and it gives you high performance and it is very inexpensive uh, or you can say there is low cost alternative to inexpensive computers. So, uh, this single system image makes a cluster appear like a single machine to the user. So, you can say if you look at different components of a cluster, it consists of standalone machines with storage, a fast inter interconnection network, high speed LAN, a low latency communication protocols. So, not only you will be using uh, hardware, I mean hard, uh, I mean fast interconnection network you have to use suitable software which will provide you low latency uh, for communication and software to give single system image that is known as cluster middleware. And of course, you will require a host of programming tools to utilize the, uh, the, the uh, utilize a cluster. And there are possible different possible configurations one is passive standby to make it reliable or to make it more available and active secondary and then you can have separate servers, uh, you can have ser servers connected to disks, servers with shared disk as it is shown in this diagram. Here you have got two computers shown here, I mean here you have got uh, one you can say. Uh, a number of processors connected to a shared bus uh, and this is connected to another uh, system uh, which is also uh, having multiple processors and with shared memory. So, these two are shared memory multiprocessors, uh, these two are connected together with a high speed messaging link to, uh, to, uh, to uh, give uh, to work as a cluster. Uh, this is another configuration in which you can have not only high speed messaging link, but you may have a shared hard disk. So, in the form of redundant array of inexpensive or independent disks. So, here a, a RAID is shared by these two systems through IO buses. So, this is standby server with shared disk. And uh, for a uh, for a cluster, you have you must be having operating system, and these are the various design issues uh, in in the context of clusters. First of all, 
you have to take care of failure man management. So, whenever you are having a large number of computers, some of them may fail. So, it will, it will tolerate failure, then it will recover from failure. So, you will require software for operating system will take care of failure management, then uh, you have to do load balancing, uh, the load has to be uniformly distributed among all the uh, nodes in a cluster then you will require parallelizing computation because uh, you will be doing a kind of uh, parallel processing with the help of these the, the number of computers. So, you will require parallelizing compiler, parallelizing application uh, which, which, which is amenable to applications which are amenable to parallelism, then parametric uh, computation. So, these are the uh, uh, operating system design issues in the context of clusters. Then you can have, here are the two basic categories or types. One can be non-dedicated clusters. So, they are essentially you may say general purpose in nature. So, for example, a network of workstations uh, use, uh, use pair computation cycles of nodes and background job distribution is done, individual owners of workstations. So, these are this is non-dedicated then you can have dedicated clusters, clusters uh, with joint ownership, having dedicated nodes and which will also allow parallel computing. <coughs> then you have got, you can have homogeneous cluster, another cl uh, way of classifying is homogeneous and heterogeneous. So, homogeneous cluster will have similar processors, all the nodes will be identical or similar softwares, operating system and softwares present in all the components all the nodes in a cluster. Alternatively, you can have heterogeneous system with different architecture, data format, computational speed, system software that means operating system and so on. So, let us see what are the advantages and disadvantages of clusters. Obviously, uh, main advantage is it gives you high availability and uh, resilient to failures. That means, when, since you have got large number of computers, if one or two fails, still it will continue to function and as a consequence it gives you high availability. And then second important feature is incremental extensibility. So, uh, as your requirement keeps on increasing with time, you keep on adding nodes in a cluster. So, you can increase the number of nodes in a cluster in a very in a incremental manner. <coughs> and desktops are cheap and ubiquitous. So, this is another important advantage. So, it, 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 you, can, you are able to provide uh, high performance computing at a very low cost, no need to buy dedicated expensive hardware. So, you can use a commodity of the self type of desktops for your application for developing a cluster. So, these are the advantages. Of course, you have got several disadvantages. Number one is administration complexity. So, since you have got, uh, you are administering n node cluster, I mean administering n node cluster is close to administering n big machines. The reason for that is each machine is autonomous with hardware, operating system, application software and so on. So, as a consequence, each of these nodes are to be administered, administered independently and separately. So, administering n node multiprocessor is close to administering one big machine. So, whenever you have got multiprocessor systems, a shared memory multiprocessor system, they are uh, you can have only it, it can be considered as one big machine, but that is not true in the context of clusters. So, and also it gives you higher cost of ownership. And second important disadvantage is uh, these uh, computers are connected through IO bus. So, in case of uh, you know we have seen shared memory multiprocessor system or massively parallel processing systems, the, the processors are connected through memory bus. So, memory bus has got higher bandwidth and smaller latency. On the other hand, whenever they are connected to uh, connected using I O bus, the bandwidth is smaller and latency, latency is larger. So, lower bandwidth and higher latency you can say. So, higher latency, higher part is missing here. So, it will be higher latency. So, this is the disadvantage. 
and another important disadvantage is n machine cluster have n independent memories and n copies of operating system as I mentioned earlier. So, since each is autonomous, you will be having independent memories, so that they can work independently and n copies of operating system. So, because uh, each, each, each can again uh, operate independently without the need of others. And here is another uh, advantage, large computers have small volume, computers have small volumes. So, uh, whenever you are building a uh, large computer, then cost has to be amortized over few systems. So, this results in higher cost. On the other hand, in, in case of cluster, cluster uh, you know clustering, uh, you have got uh, large number of low cost systems. As a result, the, the cost is much smaller. So, administrative complexity can be mitigated construction of uh, shared memory multiprocessors and keep storage outside the cluster. So, you can keep the storage outside the clusters as it happens in case of storage area network. So, these are uh, gives you some uh, components which are used like uh, the, the local area network that is being used. You can use high first ethernet or gigabit ethernet or MIRI net. So, these are the type of networks. Uh, that can be used for connecting or InfiniBand, which gives you 100 megabits per second. So, you can see the these are the rates 11.25 megabits per second or 110 megabits per second or 200 megabits per second uh, or 800 megabits per second. So, uh, the speed is quite high and uh, distance uh, maximum of course, distance is limited you can it has to be within 100 meter that is why I said that it has to be Within a, uh, within a room, but it need not be really within a room. So, 100 meter is quite uh, long distance and you can connect about 100 nodes. So, storage area network tries to optimize network of performance for short distances for example, as it happens in case of InfiniBand. So, you have much lower protocol overhead and much less security concern as it happens whenever you do the communication through internet. So, let us have a look at the taxonomy of uh, clusters. One is uh, network of work stations, example is Beowulf uh, clusters, uh, where it use uh, cords of cord species that we commonly, I mean commodity, uh, commodity uh, of the cells of the cell PCs with storage area network and you can have cluster forms existing PCs on a LAN which when idle can perform work uh, or super cluster or constellations where you can have cluster of clusters that is uh, that is within a campus. So, these are possible uh, uh, tax uh, ways in which you can build clusters. So, these are some of the examples the, the top diagram shows uniprocessor clusters each each processor uh, here you have got a single processor with uh, with its own dedicated memory and IO. So, you have got a large number of such uh, processors connected through a Ethernet uh, switch 1 GB uh, Ethernet switch. Here you have got two way uh, symmetric multiprocessor cluster because each node is having two processors with a shared memory and IO and these are connected through 1 GB uh, Ethernet switch. And, uh, and the third diagram that is shown is a 8 way SMP cluster, here uh, you have got 8 processors in each node with a shared memory and I O and which are connected with the help of again 1 uh, gigabit Ethernet switch and of course, uh, Ethernet switch may be connected to internet. So, these are the uh, 3 different types of clusters shown here based on uniprocessor nodes, two way SMP nodes or eight way SMP nodes. And this is how the, uh, uh, the uh, connections can be done flat neighborhood networks. This is, this is how the uh, interconnection can be made and this particular topology is known as FNN or flat neighborhood networks. So, this diagram shows uh, the layout of 24 node FNN 
flat neighborhood networks. Here as you can see, you have got 24 nodes 1, 2 up to 23, 0 to 23, uh, 24 nodes each having processors, memory and I O devices. And these are connected with the help of three 16 port gigabit uh, uh, switch. So, 16 port gigabit switch, but one point you should notice is that each node is connected to two switches. So, uh, <coughs> you, uh, you have got multiple network interface card, NIC stands for network interface card that means, each node is having uh, uh, multiple in this particular case two network interface card, each network interface card is connecting to one of the switches. So, two and NIC is connecting to two switches. So, this is how this is uh, this uh, the, this in this way uh, the communication between any two node can be done uh, using a single hop. <coughs> so, it requires uh, I can get uh, uh, it requires special routing to be set up at each node. 348 uh, port switches can be used to connect 64 PCs, uh, each using no more than 2 NICs per PC. So, this is a very uh, interesting topology and it can be used to realize uh, clusters. This is an example Beowulf cluster, uh, NASA uh, built first uh, Linux PC cluster in 1994. So, it is a low cost network PCs, com uh, computers connected to one another by a private Ethernet network. So, connection to any external network is through a single gateway computer. And configuration is you have you are having commodity of the self components such as inexpensive computers and uh, bl blade components are used. That means, uh, computers mounted on a motherboard that are plugged into connectors on a rack. So, you will be using a rack on the back plane, there are connectors and each of the blades can be pushed to connect to the system as I shall show you. And shared disk and shared nothing model is possible uh, in whenever you go for this type of cluster. This shows a single Beowulf uh, cluster as you can see, uh, this is the connector which can be connected to the, uh, connected to the back plane and here it shows uh, two processor, this is one processor, this is another processor to two processing modules which are present in a single blade. <coughs> and this Beowulf project uh, of NASA used uh, Linux and public domain software. So, did, they did not go for any uh, custom uh, software. So, custom software is not being used. Uh, standard uh, commodity of the solve software has been used. So, made some changes to Linux kernel to support things like channel bonding. So, we have seen uh, multiple Ethernet channels are used to connect, but uh, to con connect into a single virtual channel to overcome bandwidth limitations. We know that the Ethernet has a uh, limited bandwidth like 1 megabits per second or 10 megabits per second whenever we go, go, go for gigabit Ethernet. But if you want higher bandwidth, you can use a uh, special type of uh, technique and this is what is being done uh, known as uh, this uh, it can uh, by the, with the help of this special technique, you can combine multiple Ethernet channels into a single virtual channel. So, you can have more than 1 gigabit bandwidth, uh, so this will overcome bandwidth limitation and Beowulf clusters have become very popular and you can have uh, nodes up to 1000, uh, you can one, have 1000 nodes in a single system. Another example is Google infrastructure, Google serves on an average 1000 queries uh, per second, all of you are uh, familiar with uh, I mean use of uh, uh, when you are using the service provided by, by Google for uh, for email uh, that is Gmail and all these things. So, that is serviced with the help of this infrastructure. Uh, <coughs> so, in addition to this, uh, it is serving the queries, a search engine must crawl the web periodically to, to, ha to have up to date information. So, uh, this is uh, used 
uh, for web, ser uh, web, web search, you know, web servers. More than 6,000 PCs and 12,000 disks give one petabyte of disk storage. Rather than using RAID, this uh, Google infrastructure relies on redundant storage and sites. So each PC runs Linux, and this is only the biggest source of failure is the software in case of this infrastructure because you have got a lot of redundant. Uh, uh, I mean PCs, uh, computers uh, and other things. So, only limit uh, source biggest source, source of failure is software. So, this uh, diagram shows Google infrastructure. You can see here uh, different racks shown. So, 10 racks in, in here, 10 racks here. So, you have got 40 racks connected by 4 copper gigabit ethernet. 4 copper gigabit ethernet and uh, that links 1828 into 128 switches. So, you have got 128 by 128 switches and one rack contains 80 PCs. So, each rack is containing 80 PCs and you have got uh, 40 such racks. So, the you can imagine the number of total number of such uh, PCs are uh, present here and you are using that uh, OC 12 and is OC 45 uh, that gives you 622 megabits per second or uh, 24,988.988 gigabits per second uh, that I mean that is the rate at which you can uh, communicate with this uh, this uh, end, end switch. So, end switch gives you faster access to the entire infrastructure and you have got two such end switches at both ends. <coughs> so, this is the diagram which shows the uh, the way the uh, this is a this is a single rack <coughs> and close up view of one uh, one uh, rack PC. So, th this this diagram shows you Google infrastructure, this is another view of the cluster that is implemented with the help of Google infrastructure. Then you can have cluster of uh, shared memory multiprocessors. So, hybrid cluster of shared memory multiprocessors can be used. This is often called constellations. So, this is efficient shared memory programming at the individual nodes is possible because each is having a shared memory multiprocessor. So, this is better suited for implementation of distributed shared memory multiprocessor and this is meaningful only if P u a node not much uh, uh, only if P u a node not much expensive than P individual nodes. So, uh, this is this is what what has been observed that if you implement a P u a node that means each node is having P computers that is uh, cheaper than to have P individual nodes and then this is meaningful and that is what is being done. An example is Orion system. Okay. So, we have discussed about uh, one very uh, important topic that is your cluster computing and how clusters are implemented and various topologies and at the end we have shown some example. Now, we shall focus our attention to another way of computing. Uh, grid computing. <coughs> so, uh, why the name uh, grid computing? So, this the term grid computing originated in the early 1990s as a metaphor for making computer power as easy to access as an electric power grid. All of her you are using uh, electric power. So, uh, as you know there is a that electric line is connected uh, to each and every house and we can access it uh, without uh, much of botheration. So, we know that uh, each plug point will provide you 220 volt or 120 volt uh, depending on where you are and, uh, uh, and that, uh, that is that is the um, that, that is the main feature. So, power grid is transparent to the app appliance. So, whether you will be running a computer or you will be running some other uh, uh, some other appliance, it does not matter. You get the power and you can run different types of systems without uh, without bothering uh, 
uh, where from the power is coming and uh, how the power is available and it is all pervasive. So, it is available uh, everywhere and any power point provides same power that means you get 220 volt at each and every point. So, that is power availability is same at different points. So, that is what is the main feature of grid computing. So, availability is uniform from different places. Similarly, uh, just like power grid in compute grid is transparent to the user. So, this, this uh, compute grid is transparent to the user although it is uh, distributed throughout the country that means, uh, it is accessed through wide area network and it is pervasive and compute power is independent of where a job is initiated. So, you can initiate a job from anywhere and you will get the same computing power uh, for performing an application. So, this uh, question, uh, question naturally arises, what do you really mean by grid computing? So, this is alternative to traditional large parallel or distributed systems, which can provide better computational power for high end applications, this is known as grid and this is an innovative extension of distributed computing technology. So, grid computing is a kind of distributed computing, but uh, it is not uh, the way traditional distributed computing is done. So, uh, so it, it leverages a combination of hardware and software virtualization and the distributed sharing of those virtual resources. These are the two basic concepts. First of all, hardware and software virtualization, second is distributed sharing of these virtualized resources and these resources can include all elements of computing. So, uh, like hardware, software, applications, networking services, pervasive devices and complex footprints of computing power. So, you can see you can have different types of and uh, different elements uh, which are virtualized and available. So, it can be uh, <coughs> actually the cons uh, sometimes grid computing is also referred as CPU scavenging or cycle scavenging or cycle stealing or shared computing uh, creates a grid from unused resources or in a network of participants. So, what is happening here? You have got large number of participants and all of them are performing their own job. However, each of them may have some additional or uh, additional or extra computing power available and which is being utilized in grid computing by others through the internet. So, where worldwide or in internal to an organization. So, it can be this grid computing can be done uh, uh, through I mean across the world or internal to an organization. So, IBM's grid computing has put forward uh, that actually basic idea was use open standards and protocols to gain access to computing resources over the internet. So, you are gaining access of computing resources over the internet and, and, and you are using large number of small systems spread across a large geographical area region and it presents a unified picture to the users. So, here also it is giving some kind of unified picture to the user. So, you are not really uh, consciously accessing each of the each and every different computer. So, you are accessing a grid. So, uh, uh, where, uh, where from you are getting that computing power is transparent to you. <coughs> and, uh, this availability of high speed networking surmounts the distance problem. You may be asking how you are able to get high performance through wide area network. The reason for that is you know because of the advancement of uh, wide area network technology, now you can have uh, high bandwidth, uh, uh, the high bandwidth of access through internet and uh, that is how this uh, availability of high speed networking is uh, possible and it surmounts the distant problem. 
So, the grids can be divided uh, into several types, one is your data grid, another is your compute grid. So, data grids must focus on data location, data transfer, data access and critical aspects of security, uh, because you are handling data, then data collection, storage, retrieval from a large number of bases. So, this is, uh, this is the uh, uh, function of a data grid. Similarly, you can have computing, compute grids, it provides users with compute power for solving jobs. So, the, uh, the ab ability to allow for independent management of computing resources, the ability to provide mechanisms that can intelligently and transparently select computing resources capable of running a user's job. The understanding of the current and predicted loads on grid resources, resource availability, dynamic resource configuration and provisioning. So, uh, these are the features then failure detection and failover mechanisms. So, uh, this ensures appropriate security mechanism for secure resource management, access and integrity. An example is SETI at home, this is an example of a grid computer. And you can have uh, three different types of grid environments, one is global grids, second is enterprise grids, third is cluster grids. So, global grids are collection of enterprise and cluster grids uh, available across the globe. Then enterprise grids are multiple projects of dependent departments here, resources within an enterprise or campus. So, this is the enterprise grids. So, it does not do not address security and global policy management issues, because since it is restricted within an enterprise, you do not really require and it is not necessary to address security and global policy management issues, which is required in place of global grids. And third type is cluster grids, it is, it is the simplest form of grid, it provides compute service at the project or department level. The key, key benefits of cluster grid architectures are number one is maximize use of compute resources such as Linux machines and increase throughput for user job. So, these are the two key benefits that you achieve with the help of cluster grids and cluster grid is a uh, super set of compute resources such as Linux clusters. So, cluster grids can operate with a heterogeneous environment with mixed server types, mixed operating systems and workloads. So, this is another very important feature, so uh, you can have heterogeneous uh, environment. So, this is a uh, I mean comparison between P 2 P computing and grid computing. All of you are familiar with peer to peer computing which is uh, which involves a large number of nodes connected loosely and this P 2 P computing is primarily used for sharing files. So, you can distribute files over a large number of nodes, then for efficient sharing you distribute, then you access uh, from different nodes that is the basic idea of uh, peer to peer computing. On the other hand grids provide unified view, so target uh, solving some specific types of problems such as scientific research, business logic support, etcetera. So, it is not restricted to only fail, uh, file sharing. <coughs> so, here is a comparison between cluster computing versus grid computing. So, as I have uh, mentioned cluster computing can be said to have a subset of grid computing, because cluster nodes are in close proximity and interconnected by LAN as I have mentioned and grid nodes are geographically separate and, and uh, connected through wide area network or WAN. So, clusters provide guarantee of service, nodes are expected to give full resource. On the other hand, clusters are usually a heterogeneous set of clusters. So, uh, since uh, it is uh, distributed throughout the network availability and performance of grid resources are unpredictable and request from within an administrative domain may gain more priority over request from outside. So, this is another feature that has led to uh, I mean uh, that uh, differences in availability of different systems, availability and performance of grid resources um, I mean are unpredictable because of 
I mean because of many reasons and this is one of them. So, <coughs> so this is that example Sethi at home uh, uh, that was developed for to detect and alien signals through Arecibo uh, radio telescope world's uh, largest telescope. So, this used the ideal cycles of computers to analyze the data generated from the telescope. So, uh, over 500,000 active participants, uh, most of whom run screen saver on home PC and uh, so these uh, from these uh, active participants the computer power computing power is being used to analyze the data generated from the telescope and performance on the average over 20 teraflops per second. So, you can see you can have you can achieve massive performance because of large number of participants although each of them is uh, giving only a fraction of their computing power. Now, the big question is at some level and all application uh, applications share common needs how it is being done. So, how, how to find resources, how to acquire resources, how to locate and move data, how to start and monitor computation and how to uh, manage all uh, I mean manage it all securely and conveniently. So, for that purpose the software that is being used is known as grid middleware. So, a single software infrastructure supports all these all the above features. So, these are the different middleware components. Number one is grid information service GIS and support this supports registering and querying, uh, querying uh, grid resources, grid resource broker, uh, end users submit their application requirements to this uh, grid resource uh, broker. Then grid resource broker discovers resources by querying the GIS, GIS means this this information grid information service. Then you have got grid fabric uh, which manages resources like computers, storage devices, scientific instruments etcetera. Then you have got core grid middleware and this offers services like process management, allocation of resources, security and quality of service and so on. And user level grid middleware uh, this offers services like programming tools, resource broker, uh, scheduling application tasks for execution on global resources. So, you can see this grid computing is feasible over, uh, 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 over a large geographical area with the help of this grid middleware components. Now, uh, we have come to the last topic that is your cloud computing. Cloud computing is, is also a kind of uh, distributed computing, uh, I mean somewhat similar to uh, uh, grid computing. <coughs> In case of grid computing we have seen with grid computing one can provision computing resources as a utility that can be turned on and off. So, here in grid computing it is done in this way you can provision a resource and after the provisioning is done, you may utilize the entire resource or may utilize it part partially. And then if you do not need it, then you can turn it off. That means, you, a particular resource provisioning can be done uh, and uh, you turn it on or off. But whenever uh, an utility is being used, uh, it is not guaranteed that you are utilizing the entire uh, uh, resource. <coughs> and this cloud computing goes one step further with on demand resource provisioning. So, here we are not really uh, uh, I mean a particular resource is turned on and then, and then it does not allow I mean instead of uh, turning it on and uh, using it partially or not. In this case if a kind a concept called resource provisioning is done. So, uh, resource provisioning means you need uh, whenever you need it and as much you need it you use that. So, this is this is the on demand resource provisioning in contrast to on off type resource process provisioning done in grid computing. 
So, cloud computing is internet based computing whereby shared resources, software and information are provided to computers and other devices on demand. And one big advantage of this on demand uh, uh, resource provisioning is that you pay for the bandwidth and server resources that one needs. And when the requirement is over then, then the uh, turn the whole thing off. So, you are paying only for that part you are using and here are the benefits of cloud computing. Customer avoids capital expenditure of the company that means, here what you are doing you are not really uh, deploying uh, costly infrastructure. So, you are using third party infrastructure to perform your uh, job. So, this is one very important concept. So, this reduces the cost of purchasing physical infrastructure by, by renting the uses from a third party provider. So, uh, you are uh, only renting a part of the resources provided by a third party. So, instead of in contrast to grid computing this eliminates over provisioning when used with utility utility provision utility pricing that means, uh, instead of as I mentioned uh, whenever in grid computing it may lead to over provisioning, but in case of uh, your cloud computing over provisioning is not uh, done and as a consequence your uh, you pay only a very uh, small part and, uh, and when used with utility pricing that means you are using it as an utility and as much as you use you pay for that and it also removes the need to over provisioning uh, over provision in order to meet the demands of millions of users. You see in, in not only you are paying less, but it is also helping others this you should understand. So, you are taking or you are consuming only as much as you can. So, the remaining part is available for others. So, in this way uh, grid computing can afford to give service to a large number of users. <coughs> and uh, with grid computing companies can scale up to uh, massive capa capacities in an instant without having to invest in new infrastructure, uh, train a new personnel or license new software. So, you can see uh, you can, a, a company whenever you need massive computing, it can scale it up by hiring resources from a third party. And as soon as the uh, computing this high performance computing is over, you simply turn it off. Similarly, you can use massive storage whenever you need it. And uh, whenever you do not need it, you simply uh, you simply turn it off and also you do not you can use a special software there is no need for to license a new software. So, you are not, not, not doing the licensing the license is not your name license is, is, is in the name of the uh, service provider you are simply using it and you are paying for your uh, for the for your uses. So, without having license with of the software without having without purchasing the software, without purchasing the hardware, you are able to use them for your to your uh, advantage to your benefit. This is the benefit of cloud computing. And there are three important segments of applications. First one is the known as applications. So, applications software as a service. So, which is known as SAAS. SAS in short, SAS provides a complete turnkey application. So, complete turnkey applications such as enterprise resource management through, through the internet. So, you are, what you are doing here, uh, you are uh, using a an application, complete application through internet provided by a third party. Second, uh, second type of uh, second segment of cloud computing is platform. So, platform as a service, so which is known as PaaS. PAS. So, PaaS offers 
full or partial application development that users can access. So, it a platform is, is provided to you for, uh, for, uh, for uh, full or partial application and that can be used uh, and <coughs> um, with the help of this uh, segment, second segment platform segment. Third is your infrastructure. So, infrastructure as a service or IAS. So, a consumer can get service from a full computer infrastructure, infrastructure through the internet. So, without uh, procuring it, you are able to get full service, uh, full computer infrastructure through the internet uh, provided by a third party. So, these are the uh, three main segments which are uh, mainly available through cloud, cloud computing. Now, let us look at the different benefits and advantages of cloud computing. So, the benefits are you pay per use that means, as much as you use you pay for only that and you can have instant scalability. Uh, as soon as your requirement increases, you can scale it very quickly and you can scale down very quickly uh, as in an inst instant because you are not deploying it. Deployment uh, is it is deployed by others. So, based on your requirement you can uh, you can uh, scale it up and scale it down and only only you pay pay uh, for the for your use. Then you can have high security, high security is provided uh, through cloud computing and you can have high reliability as well because uh, when it is uh, in cloud computing as you, you have seen uh, you have got large number of computers and systems and it gives you high reliability and it also gives you high APIs. So, these are the uh, large, uh, these are the benefits of cloud computing and the advantages of cloud computing is listed here. It provides you lower cost of ownership since you are not deploying anything, you are not buying any infrastructure, hardware or software, your, uh, your cost of ownership is very small. So, it, it provides you lower cost of ownership and reduce infrastructure management responsibility. So, infrastructure management responsibility is also not with you since it is not uh, part of you, you are not really uh, performing the infrastructure management. Infrastructure management is done by a third party, you are simply using it and this is one advantage and it allow for unexpected resource loads. So, whenever uh, you have got unexpected resource load, uh, 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 you have got large number of load, you can very easily scale it up to meet the uh, load. Then faster application rollout. So, uh, because of this uh, advantages, you are working on an application by using the infrastructure and resources of cloud computing, using cloud computing, you can complete it uh, and you can roll out your application very quickly. So, this is these are the main advantages and this cloud economics is based on multi tenanted. So, that means, you can have uh, multiple resources you are using uh, as tenants and virtualization lowers cost of cost by increasing utilizations. As I have mentioned hardware and software are virtualized and it lowers costs by increasing utilization of the resources and economics of scale afforded by technology. So, uh, uh, since large number of people are using it, uh, you know uh, that uh, the, uh, the, the economy the, as a res uh, result cost is divided among a large number of users. So, economics of scale afforded by technology. So, technology itself is providing this uh, sharing of cost by a large number of users and automated update policy. So, uh, that means that as and when as the uh, requirement keeps on increasing, the infrastructure, infrastructure is also upgraded uh, to satisfy the requirements of users, uh, whether it is hardware resource or software resource, uh, these resources are kept on increasing. So, these are the uh, 
uh, different aspects of cloud computing. So, to summarize in this lecture we have discussed three important types of computing. First one is cluster computing that is primarily used for high performance computing and we have seen computers are rustic are within uh, within a small geographic area that is LAN. On the other hand, grid computing and cloud computing, in case of grid computing and cloud computing, resources are distributed through internet. And of course, uh, in grid computing it is done in one way and in cloud computing it is done in one way. And because of many benefits and advantages of cloud computing, it is becoming increasingly popular. Thank you.